afternoon, speaking to you again from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and again with some notes on a program of Beethoven's music this time. Uh, it begins with a sonata, the sonata in G, Beethoven's last for violin and piano, and a piece which comes from a moment in Beethoven's career where things are changing and changing somewhat willfully, as is often the case with Beethoven, but also in the course of a long career as, as deeply uh, engaged as his all the time with uh, moving forward. Um, it's, a, it's a moment where the gears are not meshing so simply as they were. If we think back to the Razumovsky quartets, uh, Roica Symphony, the time when Beethoven's life when he was willing to expand, open up really large planes of music, let things develop and settle and, and really take up space in a very commanding way. This piece, this sonata in G, is among a number of pieces which do not occupy their space in such a grand and generous way, but instead become interested in quick adjustments, details of small dimension, which turn out to be uh, more meaningful than you might expect initially. A perfect example being the little Philip, which starts that's this sonata in G for violin, a casual motive, one which you would think uh, is very lacking in the kind of uh, evidence of, uh, of force and strength that is often associated with Beethoven. Instead, almost like an aside or a, a, little, a, a kind of a little uh, inadvertent uh, shudder. But he goes on to make a piece which players find extremely exacting to play. If they played earlier pieces like the Kreutzer Sonata, the famous one uh, where the violin and piano are really treated as big virtuoso music with plenty of room to say there's peace. Much in the sonata is what we would call interjectional. Exchanges where uh, responses are being made player to player and within the music and everything has to happen kind of turning on a dime. This is true in the first movement. It's true even in the slow movement where little bits of configuration are not de decorative. They're instead quickly melodic, a kind of playing which players probably had to get used to then and still have to get used to it now. A very short scherzo, really disproportionately so, even for Beethoven. A last movement, which is variations, which seem to have said their piece and then suddenly take off towards the end with a whole new burst of energy and I would have to say a new burst of complexity. So a sonata in that moment of adjustment towards another discourse, which is the discourse that we know probably best from the final quartets where it's become almost a dialogue between Beethoven and himself. It's somewhat more public than that at this stage. In our program, we then make an adjustment backwards in Beethoven's life to two pieces which uh, come from a somewhat earlier time uh, and from a somewhat different mode of address. The piano trio in E flat is Beethoven's most comprehensive piece of chamber music to that point. It's paired with another trio, the Archduke, which is probably better known, which is a less explorative piece, more public piece. But this one, this wonderful piano in E flat, piano trio in E flat, is a kind of summation of Beethoven's art of chamber music up to this point. Um, each instrument is an equal participant in the dialogue. And the discourse of the piece is both uh, when need be leisurely and uh, conversational, and at times has even 
uh, and unexpectedly hectic and grandiose and crazy as in the last movement. It begins with one of the best Beethoven beginnings, something that sounds like an introduction, but which turns out to be a, an integral part of the thematic material of the first movement, reappearing at all kinds of different junctures and really seeming to be not just a preludial, but the generating force of the piece. The two middle movements of the piece are quite unusual, uh, a kind of playful, almost childlike dialogue, Haydn-esque uh, slow movement, not really slow, but rather elegant and graceful. And then a Landler, a dance in which a voice from the future speaks. Almost everyone who plays it notices that Schubert just walks into the room uh, as if Beethoven has a foretaste of a composer who was him, uh, one of his greatest admirers, actually, late in his life, Schubert. And then I mentioned the last movement. The last movement is one of those where the players are, have to tear the cover off their instruments. Uh, it gets so heated and so incredibly uh, filled with animation that really only in a performance of sufficient verve does it say it say. Another piece from that grand middle period of Beethoven is the fourth piano concerto. And it's a piece of remarkably, in the first one, remarkably leisurely forward motion. Plenty of time for the soloist and uh, with the help of the instruments to explore all dimensions of its melodic discourse. Um, it exists not only, of course, in the familiar version with full orchestra, but in another version which was discovered only recently, but believe, is believed to be by Beethoven and made a couple of years after his uh, introduction of the piece itself. And it's for string quintet accompaniment and soloist. The curious and interesting thing about this version is the addition of a number of fanciful Phillips into the solo part. So fanciful and so odd in certain cases that the authorship was disputed. On the other hand, if we can imagine Beethoven as an improviser, he probably sounded quite a lot like our soloist, Robert Levitt, that is to say, uh, filled with surprises and trying some things which were generally idiomatic and indigenous to the piece, but I'm sure occasionally not so much. So we're pleased to present the first of our two performances that we uh, sponsored at the festival of this version of this concerto with Mr. Levin embarking upon a cadenza, which I think will curl every hair of every listener. Thank you, and I will be back with the next program soon. <laughs>